All right, this is the last talk of the day, I think. Uh, and we saw amazing talks from all the areas in perception, control, planning, language, and different kind of robotics. So we have seen what a lot of people have done. This talk is going to be what I want to do and what should be the future that I think over the next three to four years. And this inspiration actually comes from just watching a lot of different um, other areas where people have really succeeded by building something called a knowledge base. Um, so people all know of, of examples of like knowledge bases such as Apple Siri, uh, Google search engines, Watson. Uh, just by gathering a lot of examples uh, that could come through images, that could come through natural language databases, that could come through other resources. Uh, people, if, if you use them properly, you can create value and you can create every device, every application very powerful. So over the last 10 years, I have been working in different areas, primarily 3D perception and vision, but also a little bit recently in planning and language. And one thing I noticed that is missing in robotics is this kind of knowledge base. I have worked with five to 10 different research, research labs, and I have I a have bunch of students who keep on working in these independent silos. Um, and what I realize is that what we really need to build is this giant knowledge base that could crawl all the available information over the internet that could connect to different robots. And, and it could provide a service to the robot so you can use um, what the robots need whenever they want to. So just to give a few examples, like um, I have been working with uh, self-driving cars, with industrial robots or assembly lines, and primarily with also with personal robots. And I will talk, give the talk today, the rest of the seven minutes, in the context of this particular personal robot. So here you are, what you are seeing here. So here someone uh, verbally asked the robot to prepare something uh, called affogato. Now, the, even the programmers working with the robot did not know what an affogato is. And this robot is in a new environment, and this is a new task. Uh, and the affogato, he described that you should make it by getting some coffee in a cup, adding some raspberry syrup of your choice, and adding some ice cream. Now, this may seem very intuitive to us. And by the way, we have been doing this over tens and hundreds of tasks. So this is not a demo. This is an experiment. Um, it seems very intuitive to us that, oh, get a coffee. Like, that's easy, right? Just, just find coffee and, and get it from back over there. What we are really doing in our head is we are using the knowledge base we have learned uh, to get, do these inferences. So as soon as you hear of something called in coffee, you immediately see, I don't see something called black liquid. There's nothing called black liquid in this environment, in this 3D environment. What I see is maybe some coffee dispenser and an espresso machine in the back. So is coffee related to a dispenser? Uh, maybe it is. Uh, and if it is, then I should go to the dispenser and then try to operate that dispenser, which requires manipulation. So this is how um, such kind of knowledge bases are actually built in many of the scenarios, such as OpenPsych, WordNet, or many other places where you have different symbols, such as coffee, mug, cup, connected through these finite number of relations. So whenever you ask a text, such as take some coffee in a cup, you could actually query the graph finding the coffee, and if you don't find coffee in the environment, you can find the next uh, most relevant thing, maybe an espresso machine or a container, and get the coffee in a mug. But if the mug is not there, you can actually get it in a cup also, because cup serves the same purpose. And do this kind of thing by querying the graph. So this is what I, we are building, but this is the easy part, because just getting the symbols, uh, you can get it very easily by just parsing uh, millions and tens of millions of documents on the internet. What is challenging here is to actually translate these things into real uh, robotic actions, right? So how do you actually convert um, something as simple as take some coffee in a cup to a real robotic action? So part of this graph, this robo-brain that we are building, a robo-brain is this giant graph, is actually to also have connections to the different controllers, language, and perception. To give a few examples, when we talk about cup, it will, not, it will not just be a symbol cup. It will actually be related to an action called grasping, which actually tells you that given that particular cup with an image of 3D model, you can grasp it in that particular point that is shown over there in the yellow. Um, and then we have some machine learning methods that actually tell you that 
if you see a cup, you should convolve that cup with that function that you see over there, that is a 3D depth map, and that will give you the most likely place you should grab a cup. So these kind of relations from symbols to actual actions like grasping or planning actually a part of the big graph we are building. And you can instantiate this graph whenever you see a robotics problem. To give another example, um, usually objects are not, not found alone, they're actually found in the environment. So in addition to the semantic links between the objects, we also have spatial properties about the objects. For example, in this scene, if you are trying to figure out where a cup would be, um, you could relate it to table, and you know that that x, y, z coordinates of the cup are related to table in a particular way. So these spatial relations also become a part of the graph. Not only that, we have also have very powerful models of uh, people, how people are using different objects, because robots have really have to work with, uh, with people. Uh, so that kind of information also goes into the, into the graph. And some physics-based models also are part of the graph. Um, you can watch a lot of videos, so as Peter Abil and a couple of other people showed that learning from demonstration, you can actually see a lot of people doing certain things. For example, having, putting a cup in a microwave. What you can do is extract these representations, these trajectory parameters, uh, which in our case look like Gaussian process parameters, but in someone else's case may look slightly different, and you can push this information into the graph. Now, what you would know is that if you want to figure out how a cup needs to be moved, you can figure out that those are the most likely ways that the cup could move. And this is, these are parameters which mean if you give it a new environment, the machine learning model on that node would actually output adjusted trajectories that are most relevant. That could be used for other applications such as planning or language. So what I'm going to do next, is to actually show how this graph could be used in many situations. So this was just for the cup. Our graph has, I think it exceeded 100,000 and reaching a million concepts that we have been running, learning by crawling um, WordNet um, and a lot of other databases such as OpenPsych and our other parallel projects such as Tell Me Dave, which there was a poster about. So we are collaborating with four universities and 10 different research groups and crawling the internet to build this kind of graph. Now I will, in the last two minutes, I will try to show you that this graph is so powerful that many of us could use this graph, which is an open source SDK, which will be available in a month. Anyone can use it. I'm going to show two examples how we can translate our robotic applications into queries or searches over the graph. So imagine one of the applications that we are doing is that, well, a human is doing something in the environment. Uh, in that case, you are over there. And you can use some standard computer vision algorithms to figure out where the person is, where the object is. And you can do this very well by using our software, which has been running at different companies and research groups, including Qualcomm and Google. And what you, what you get out is that there is a person there, there is a fridge there, there is something else there. So you can ask the graph that, um, ask the brain or the knowledge base that when a person is in this orientation, what is the, uh, how, do, how does this particular pose or the features relate to uh, symbol, and you would get this output. Um, these are the top answers that you could get. And now you can ask that in this situation, uh, let's query the graph, like what are the potential actions that could be done um, in the future given this possibilities. So it turns out that given this situation, if you look at the um, spatial locations and videos of past activities in different situations, the, the probabilities tell you that the most two likely actions are reaching and placing, and if you want to reach, you could reach there, or you could, and you can reach in this particular way. You can even extract that, because this information is part of this big graph, which you are querying to get these answers, um, and so on. And if you expand the query on the placing, you can get these answers. Now, this is very useful for a robot, because in that situation, what the robot has now are the top things that they, a, a human can do. Um, and here is an application of that. So a robot is seeing this person. Um, this is run, uh, running on a robot called PR2. Um, and this is slowed down to make you see what is happening, uh, unlike making it faster in most robotic videos. So we are slowing it down. And you can see that the, pro the robot can actually see in adva advance what the person may be doing. And we are showing the top three likelihoods. Um, and this is on a new scenario with a new person. And the robot can figure out what could be happening. Um, and in case, then you can program it to, to open, the, open the door. 
um, for opening the door, this part is not a part of the graph right now, but you can again query how does the handle looks like, what do I do with this handle or this towel, um, and so on. So we are hoping that people can push um, as collaborators more and more information into the graph so it becomes more and more useful. Now, another example is this Afogato example. So um, again, the person is asking verbally what to do. Um, and now it can take that natural language and figure out a sequence of controllers by querying the graph that try to do something as close to the language as possible, but something that makes sense in this 3D environment. And something that is possible from a manipulation point of view. It, it is all in the graph. It has to find a consistent answer using machine learning. And the parameters and the knowledge is stored in the graph. This ice cream part is actually hard-coded. Uh, it's autonomous, but it is hard-coded. So a programmer did that. Other things are using the, the softwares that we have developed in the past uh, for grasping and for motions and so on. Um, so this, this project is a really a, 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 uh, an open source project, with a, which is a currently a collaboration between four universities, Stephanie Telex from Brown, um, and, and, and eight other professors from Berkeley, Stanford, and Cornell, where I am from. And we are partnering with a lot of knowledge bases, including WordNet, WikiHow, TellMeDev, ImageNet, uh, and, and so on. And we are pushing this into the, into the brain, and it would be available soon for you to use. And this is work in collaboration with a bunch of his students and professors, including Silvio, Severasi, Bart, and Thorsten Joachims. Thanks. Can you come to the mic, please? I can't hear you. Do you have any input on potential effects of size of this graph on the performance of the? So current, yeah. So that? I think the size is really coming from what we have been crawling and getting uh, inputs from the partner research group so far. Right now, our graph is about 100, 100 200 thousand nodes and a couple of million concepts. Um, but and we are, I am spending like fifty dollars a day on compute services. But as we are crawling every day, the size of this graph would be. Tens of millions of nodes and hopefully a billions of edges and concepts learned. Yeah, so basically I meant what's the effect of size of this graph on the performance of that? Let's say if we have a huge network, would we have problems with, uh, first of all, stability of the system that would use that graph or performance of that or uh, responsiveness of the system? So there are two questions here, performance in terms of computational efficiency and performance in terms of accuracy. So computational yeah, right. efficiency, we all watch movies on streaming movies. We all know how to solve um, streaming HD videos on our computers in the night. So we, have, uh, we, are, we are working with people who can handle the si this large size of graph by using the right choices in the databases. So that is no not at all a concern. Our cycles are fractions of a millisecond as they should be. Performance is an interesting concern, which comes from really integration of different knowledges. So if you get conflicting, conflicting information from a WikiHow recipe or from a YouTube video, you will get these bad answers out sometimes, because there's way too much information into the graph. So a part of this graph, which I did not describe, is a ranking function. We have beliefs, beliefs about the truth of concepts in the graph. So when you query the graph, what you get is a ranked list of answers. Uh, and then you can make sense of it. And we also have crowdsourcing to fix some of these things. If you go to robobrain.me page, and if you like or play some video games on our online websites, our brain would get better. <laughs> all right, we here at Stanford uh, would like to thank all of you, especially the uh, professors and two presenters, and of course the audience for attending. And we uh, look forward to a fantastic event next year at Berkeley. Yeah, we can also leave pretty some feedback for here. Thank you.